It's now time for the Sudsy Wudsy Show. Brought to you by Sudsy Wudsy. Sudsy Wudsy. It's an all-purpose cleaner. It's a car wash. It's a bubble bath. Yes, it's Sudsy Wudsy. Sudsy Wudsy now proudly presents The Adventures of Jimmy Ballpoint. Private investigator. Ear, eyes, and nose. The complete package. Jimmy Ballpoint. This is where I work. The city. It used to be a nice place with nice people. But like everything else, they left. And now the city is a dark and gritty city. With dark and gritty sidewalks. With dark and gritty taxis. Downright depressing. If it wasn't for the gum stuck under the tables at the automat. I'm Jimmy Ballpoint. Private investigator. Ear, eye, and nose. The complete package. My office is up three flights of stairs, straight up, right above a flop house. A little office with a desk, chair, sink, and a couch. Like I said, a dark and gray place. But it's just right for a guy like me. working on now is the case of It's in the Box. It was a lazy morning, not much to say beyond that. I sat back in my chair, pulled open my desk drawer, took out a pint of amber glow and gave my coffee a splash. Just something to get the old ticker going. A silhouette on the frosted glass of my office door told me I was about to have company. The door opened and it was Sully dropping off the morning mail. Sully was like a clock. Every morning at about ten, the door opened and a pile of bills hit my desk. Morning, Sully. Sully just nods shuffles through his bag just to make sure he didn't miss something, then turns and walks out, always leaving my office door open just a crack. Like every morning, I get up, walk over and nudge the door closed with my foot. I start to walk back to my desk when I notice a postcard of sorts sticking out of the pile of bills. Hmm, looks kind of official. Well, this is a first. I notice that I have a special letter or something to sign for. I opened my desk drawer and pushed the rest of the mail into it and snugged my pint of amber glow against a stack of file folders. That ought to sit tight till I get back. I left my office, walked down the stairs, all three flights, straight down, passing Vernon's office. His door was ajar, and I pushed it open just a bit with my finger to take a look inside. Vernon was stretched out on his Murphy bed, still in his getup from his work last night. Vernon had a case of a running down a mug who his wife suspected him of two-time air. Looks like Vernon found the guy. Or maybe the mug found Vernon. Vernon looked like the center of an accordion, you know, the wrinkled thing. Better let old Vernon sleep that one off. I walked down the stairs and out of the building walked down the sidewalk and passed 
Two Fingers Tommy Shoeshine Stand and Angel's Bar. Both seemed slow with business. Probably a good thing this early in the morning. Things usually didn't start moving around here until 10 a.m. or so. I passed the taxi stand and there, as usual, was stuttering Stepan, sound asleep, slouched over against his car door. Better let him be. Get him going and it's a good 20 minutes into a two-word conversation. I crossed the street and headed into the federal building and up to the postal counter. I slipped the notice I got under the bars in the window, then waited for about 15 minutes for someone to get up and take notice. The postal clerk brought over a large brown envelope. I signed for it and left the building. I found a sidewalk bench and settled in to see what I had. A note inside gave me a phone number to call. I headed back to my office, settled into my swivel chair, and as I tossed the envelope on the top of my desk, some moolah spilled out. A lot of moolah. It was 500 smackers. That got me thinking. Now what could possibly be so important as to give me 500 smackers, sight unseen, just like that? On the other hand, if this is about old man Pierogi, hmm, my curiosity got the best of me, and I picked up the phone and took the receiver off its cradle and started dialing the number. The phone rang just two times, then went very quiet on the other end. I said hello a few times and was about to hang up when a dame answered and said, Mr. Ballpoint, you're prompt. I'll say that much for you. I paused and then told the dame and a lot more where that came from. The dame told me that a certain party had need of my services, someone very important. But for now, I'd be dealing with the dame. I kept on sliding the 500 clamps between my thumb and my index finger, thinking about this business arrangement, thinking, thinking. The dead air on the phone drew the attention of the dame and in a loud and pronounced voice, well, do we have an understanding? Good, she said. Then she said, go to the city morgue and find Mooch, the torpedo. Find a small envelope in his suit pocket. Call this number when you have it and wait for further instructions. The envelope contains nothing of my concern, so don't even go there. And by all means, keep this to yourself. The line went dead, nothing. I will admit the instructions were straightforward. And for 500 smackers, that's about as straightforward as it gets. I sat in my chair and mulled the name over and over. Mooch. Mooch. Now where have I heard that name before? I went over to the stack of newspapers near my couch, settled in and started flipping through some old news. Ah, bingo. Here it is. I knew I heard that name before. It says, Notorious Mobster, Manny the Mooch, a mob hitman, was arrested on numerous outstanding warrants. A known gangster who 
local authorities say was responsible for many mob-related murders. Mooch, as he was referred to, was released on bail pending further investigations. Hmm. Well, Mooch, looks like things got up to you. Come to think of it, I'd better get going if I want to settle this deal with 500 bucks. I left my office heading down the stairs and thought about going to the city morgue. Not the greatest place to spend the afternoon, but hey, 500 smackers is 500 smackers. As I headed down the staircase, I passed Vernon's office. His office door was open and he was sitting at his desk. He was dressed up in a duck outfit while talking on the phone. He motioned me in, then covered the receiver with his hand. He asked me, Jimmy, do you know how to get to Miller's Pond? Seems as though Vernon has a case of a wandering husband who took his secretary out to the family summer cottage on the shoreline of Miller's Pond. I gave him directions, then continued down the stairs. As I got to the bottom of the stairs, it then dawned on me that it was the start of duck season. Hmm. Well, Vernon will figure that out. I stopped at the taxi stand, opened the back door of the taxi, and was about to get in. Then I froze. You gotta be kidding me, I forgot. Stuttering Stefan's cab. He woke up from his nap just in time to get a glimpse of me. Great. This is just peachy. I got into the back, told Stefan, the city morgue, and off we went. Stefan started to talk about the game last night. The ballpark had a sellout crowd. And by the time we got to the morgue, he was still on the first batter, one ball and one strike. I flipped Stefan a saw buck and headed into the front door of the joint. This place gives me the creeps. Has that smell, that smell of alcohol and sterile wipes, gauze and bleached out things. I approached the dame at the reception desk and told her I was here to see Mooch. I mean, she interrupted and asked if I had an appointment. What? You mean I gotta have an appointment to see a dead guy? The dame swiveled around in her chair, crossing her legs. Her shiny silk stockings held a shapely, slender set of pins that caught my attention, and she knew it. She leaned back and asked if that was the only thing I was there to see. I had to refocus my attention to the reason for being there. She reached for her cigarette resting on the edge of a marble ashtray. It had burned out. She brought the cigarette to her ruby red lips when she noticed it was out. Before she realized it, I had a shiny new Ronson flipped open and held it up, offering her a light. She hesitated at first, but then smiled. The cigarette to her lips then blew smoke towards me. She smiled and asked if the lighter was getting hot. I smiled back and told her it's always hot for a pretty dame like her. Just then a mountain of a mug interrupted the mood. He was pushing a gurney. The mug looked at the dame and said good morning, Esther, then glanced at me with a look of contempt. Okay, this is just peachy. Frankenstein and me are about to go round one at the sign of the bell. The dame could sense some kind of trouble was brewing. So she told, get this, Maurice, everything was fine. And told Maurice 
to show this gentleman to the morgue. The mug asked if I had an appointment. There they go again, an appointment to see a dead guy. Besides, it was all I could do to hold myself back after hearing Maurice's squeaky voice. With a grunt and a nod of his head, I followed him to an elevator, then down to the morgue. The silence in the elevator was deafening. The elevator doors opened, and there was the morgue. Not the neatest place, but I've seen worse. The mug looked at me with contempt again and told me to look around. He went back to the elevator. The doors closed slowly with the guy staring at me right until the doors closed in front of him. Okay, Moocher, where are you? Now, Moocher was only 5'5", five five, so this should be uh, easy. Come to think of it, there must have been a sale on 5'5 five five mugs. The place was loaded with them. I amused myself by muttering to myself, Okay, guys, let's not all talk up at once. Hmm. This guy looks like a 5'5". Five five. I started to slowly peel back the white wrappings. Sheesh, ballpoint. Of all the things you gotta do for a buck. The place is half lit, quiet, with an eerie place to say the least. Just as I was about to get a glimpse, a voice from behind me startled the daylights out of me. The dame just smiled and told me that I was in the right place for that. I asked her what did they call her at home in a sarcastic tone. She said her name was Esther Easy. You gotta be kidding. Her smile started to get to me. Then a cold, clammy hand rubbed against me. The wrapping that I took back left this stiff's arm fall out. Okay, okay. First a nutsy dame, then a dead guy's trying to shake hands with me, and there's Maurice the Mountain. I gotta get out of here. I was about to hit the elevator button up, sideways, anywhere but here. The 500 clams brought me back to reality while I was here in the first place. I opened Moocher's jacket and bingo, there was an envelope, just like the dame on the phone said there'd be. Just my luck, a racing form. I checked the other pocket, ballpoint. I started with a tall mug and a long white lab coat and thin wire glasses with a name tag that had a foreign name on it with doctor printed above it, started to walk towards us. He asked me what business did I have being in this part of the morgue. The dame walked over to the doctor and asked if he still wanted to show her his office, turning to me with a smirk on her face. The doctor told me to leave or he'd call the cops. I headed for the elevator, all the while watching the dame go arm in arm with the mug and the long white goat. I got back to my office, settled in for supper I picked up at Carney's Diner. As I ate, I flipped through the pages of the evening edition and found that Moocher was having a wake at Sepoli's funeral home tomorrow at 7 o'clock. Hmm. This is my last chance to grab that envelope. I finished supper and nursed a few shots of my pint of amber glow. I settled in for some sack time, an easy place to end the day, all to the temple of a red sign flashing just outside my office window. 
across the street. A flashing red light that said, Eats. I spent the rest of the next day figuring out how I could get into the coat pocket of Moocher without being noticed. After all, there was going to be a crowd at the wake. I was early at Sepulici's funeral home. I slowly walked by Moocher's box. Yeah, he looked pretty good for a mug filled with lead. I glanced back and forth and noticed not much of a crowd. I was about to reach into his coat pocket when this tall, creepy mug showed up and asked if I was a relative. Nah, just a friend, I told him. We both stood there, looking at each other. I finally left and took a seat next to a fancy lamp with tassels hanging from the lampshade. The longer I sat, the more people filed in. I was amazed at the crowd that showed up for this mug. Granted, he was with the who's who of this kind of business. A rough business at that. The crowd settled down. Small groups, each to his own. Ah, now's my chance to make my move. The tall, creepy guy left. No one is around the box. Okay, go for it, ballpoint. As I stood next to Moocher's box, my hands rested on the side of the box, then slowly started to reach for the vest pocket on Moocher. I turned, and it seemed that everyone's eye in the place was on me. I started to slowly take my hand away, when a voice from behind startled the daylights out of me. It was the sultry dame from the morgue. She looked at me and smiled and said, I thought I saw you come in here. You are crying out loud, woman. Why didn't you just club me with a hammer? I took the dame by the arm and we sat by the lamp with the fancy shade. I got up and walked over to Moocher to pay my final respects. As I stood next to Moocher in a box, I glanced towards the front door of the place and saw the dame walk out. You know, Mooch, if you could walk like that, I'd follow you too. Well, you rest in peace, Moocher. See ya. The dame was waiting for me by the street corner. I flagged down a taxi, opened the back door, and she got in. We drove to her place, an uptown joint, in a nice section. Hmm, high-priced apartment you got here. She said it's quiet and private, just the way she liked it. The dame still had a cigarette in her hand, raised it to her lips and asked if I could work the lighter. First things first, I told her, the envelope. She handed over the envelope, and I stuffed it in my suit coat pocket. And then she handed me my watch and some loose change. Hmm. I thought I had a few knuckles short here. She said, aren't we all? Hmm. I kind of like this dame. We spent the rest of the evening talking about Moocher. The morning came around to the smell of fresh perk coffee. I poured myself a cup of joe, then went over to a mirror in a narrow hallway to tie my tie. The dame came around from behind me and said, Here, let me do that. Men never know how to tie a tie. It's either too long or too short. You mugs always seem to have a problem with that. I thought to myself, not knowing how to tie a tie, or too long or too short thing. I thought it was best to just leave the wallop alone. I left the dame, 
got a taxi back to my office. I was tempted to open the envelope. The voice telling me not to came back to me. I picked up the receiver off its cradle and dialed the number that I was given once I got the envelope. The phone rang only twice, and the voice on the other end was the same deep voice of a woman that I had talked to originally. She asked if I had the envelope. I said yes. Then what do I do with it? She said, burn it. Then told me to reach into my suit coat vest pocket. I did, and there was the cigarette case with my lighter. The phone line then went dead. I hung up the receiver on the cradle, then leaned back in my chair and reached into my bottom desk drawer and pulled out that pint of amber glow that I wedged between the file folders the day before. I wiped a shot glass out with my tail of my suit coat, poured a slug, then had breakfast. I then had a foggy memory of something in the paper about Moocher. A picture. Yeah, that's it. A picture. I found the paper with his picture and the obituary. There standing next to him a few years earlier was his wife. So, that's it. Then I remember the rumors floating around that Moocher the Torpedo had a list of all his paying customers, and he kept it safe, hid away. As I took another shot, I looked at the envelope sitting on the top of my desk. So, this must be the list in the envelope. It then dawned on me that now I had it, a list that could get me bobbing up and down in the river like on the end of a fishing line. As I reached for my ashtray, then my lighter, I couldn't help but remember last night. Poor Moocher. He sure missed one heck of a night. I held the envelope up over the ashtray, reached for my lighter and flicked it several times, each time getting a spark off the flint, but no light. I brought the lighter closer to me, flicked it a couple of times, again, just sparks. After a closer examination, hmm, I'm out of lighter fluid. I couldn't help but think to myself, I'm out of lighter fluid. Huh. Well, like I said, it was one heck of a night. Well, folks, that concludes another episode of Jimmy Ballpoint, Private Investigator, brought to you by Sudsy Wudsy, that all-purpose cleaner. Keep your radio dial on this station for next week's Jimmy Ballpoint, Private Investigator. Here, I knows the complete package. <laughs>